I bring greetings to you from the Ganga team. And I hope that you and all your family members are good and safe in these challenging times. The Indian Orthopedic Association, along with Janssen, has taken this excellent step of continuing the education. And we at Ganga are really happy and proud and feel privileged to be a part of this. So I would also like to thank to start off for Ortho TV to join in this initiative so that the reach would really be great. So how to read plain x-rays of the thoracolumbar spine. Now, as I told in the introduction, a clinician is only as strong as his diagnosis. And for this, we go through these following steps. History, clinical examination, plain x-rays and advanced imaging. Unfortunately, in these present days, when diagnostic radiology is moving into high technology, there is a lot of emphasis on MRI, PET scans, CD scans, and DTIs. And radiologists are still most concerned with cross-sectional imaging, most of them. Neurologists and neurosurgeons usually do not even order a plain X-rays. And so the question is, is plain radiology still relevant in spine? Let me show this example. Now, this is a 36-year-old female who has a definite indication for a surgery for L45 disc. And the plain X-rays look normal. But when we do a flesh and stress X-rays, you can very clearly see that there is a instability over here. If this was missed and surgery was done only by doing uh, MRI, then the results would have been disastrous. Also in many of these cases where, whether it may be a deformity or whether it is a extensive spondylolytic uh, issues, what you do to manage, what level you will intervene and how do you look at progress completely depends upon plain x-rays. So x-rays are informative to a great extent. Only sadly, the art of reading plain x-rays are often forgotten. So when we say x-rays are not important, probably we meet in the eyes do not see what the mind does not know. It is also important to know that a good orthopedic surgeon needs to be his own radiologist at least as far as the plain x-rays are concerned, because we use them so often and it is impossible to wait for a radiologist report in every one of these cases. So it is quite important that we should have a good knowledge of good x-rays. If you are going to depend a lot on x-rays, then we should make sure that you have a good x-ray. I would like to emphasize this to every one of the junior surgeons because Often we see big disasters happening because of poor excess. And in this, we need good exposure, adequate covering of the region and position of the excess. Now look at here. If you look at an X-ray like the one that you see on your left, it's obvious it is bad. What is in the center may be acceptable for lots of us, but you need to ensure that in your institution, all your x-rays are what you see as what you see on your right. Now, most of us would not accept this x-rays. Most of us would accept this, but you need to actually accept only the right one because otherwise you will miss the disc degeneration over in the L5-S1, uh, listhesis of grade one in L4-5, and also an ossification of the disc and PLL at a higher level. Now, all these are very, very important. Now, the exposure depends upon your BMI, and obviously your exposure needs to be different for somebody with a greater BMI. It depends upon bone density. And so you need to have a trained radiographer who will individualize it for the patient. The second obvious thing is most important is that adequate covering of the region. If you look at an AP and the lateral view of the lumbar spine, this is exactly what you must be seeing. The X-ray should cover from T11 to coccyx in the spine. The sacrum and the sacral egg joint and the ilium and the pelvis must be nicely seen and also the, both the hip joints. If you do not have this adequate exposure, 
you can get into a lot of problems. For example, the one on your left looks good for the lumbar spine, but if you miss the lumbosacral spine, then obviously a small listhesis may be missed. Now, this was a patient, an elderly patient, who was actually being treated for degenerative scoliosis and back pain and gluteal pain for a long period of time. But when an adequate exposure is done, you can see that there is also a problem in both hips, which can actually be the cause for the pain. So make sure that you have an adequate X-ray, which covers the entire region of interest. If you do not cover the hips, if you do not cover the sacroiliac joint, you can miss early ankylosing spondylitis, changes in the SI joint. And sometimes even big disasters can happen because you miss tumors in the ilium or in the pubis or in the close by regions. The third important thing that before you will accept an X-ray is make sure that the patient's position has been correct as per the beam. Now you can see it is of the same patient. When there is a small rotation of the beam or the patient lying with a small rotation, you can see that you do not see the L5-S1 junction adequately. The disk space is not seen. A small vacuum sign is missed in the uh, picture. And also a lysis, which is seen on the right film, is not seen on the left film. So a good exposure, adequate covering of the region, and positioning of the patient are all important. When you do not see any of these, the question then comes, would you accept an X-ray which is of poor quality or not? Now, it might be sometimes embarrassing to ask the patient to go again for an X-ray, but we have to understand that a misdiagnosis or a wrong diagnosis is costlier than repeat an X-ray. And when you do that, it might even undermine the confidence that the patient has on you. So don't hesitate till you have a good X-ray. Now, the next temptation for most of us is to look at the lateral view of the spine uh, first than the AP view. But you should always start with an AP view because you will understand over a period of time with the experience, AP view gives tremendous amount of information with which you can look at things in the lateral view much better. All these things need to be seen and they have to be seen in a very correct and disciplined manner. And of course, the first one is the alignment. Alignment you look at by having an imaginary line, a central line which passes through the spinous process. And any deviation from this, you will know that the alignment is wrong. You can also look at the alignment by drawing a line on the lateral walls of all the vertebra. And the normal alignment of these lateral lines is that is of an inverted funnel. Now, if this is not true, you can see that when you draw the lines, you can see that it is out of alignment. Now, this alignment may be out at one region and it may be an angular alignment loss or the angle can be because of a congenital reason like a wedged vertebra or it might be a global loss of alignment. And all these gives a clue because all these represent different pathologies and you can understand what is happening better. When you're talking about alignment, not only angulation is important, but also translation is very important. Now you can see here that there is a translation loss of alignment. And even in this scoliosis, it's important to know that between L3 and L4, you have a loss of alignment in the way of translation also. Because each of these vertebral bodies are placed on each other. More than angulation, it is translation that will cause dural compression. And so you have to look at it very carefully. The alignment is next to look at is the pedicular alignment. As I mentioned before, the normal is to have an inverted funnel uh, appearance. If you have both these lines straight, then it means that there is a congenital stenosis. And in achondroplasia, you have an opposite where there is a vertical funnel shape. And these are usually associated with a tremendous amount of congenital uh, stenosis. We then have to identify 
each of the anatomical structure and the picture gives actually a screw. Now, of course, the body is very important, but the next important uh, anatomical structure are the pedicles. And you can see that it has been likened to two eyes of the owl and the spinous process, which is much lower down in relationship to the pedicle, almost gives the appearance of the beak of an owl. And these are the two ears of the owl. So this, you can see that this is a picture that comes to your mind. And this is the analogy that has been described. And this is quite useful because you can have a systematic way in which you can look at each of the vertebra quickly and make sure that there is no destruction over here. Loss of a pedicle, as you can see over here, always denotes a destructive lesion. It looks like a winking owl and it is often due to a metastasis. Now, when you look at these pedicles, it is not just a destruction, but even if one of the pedicles are looking more sclerose than the other, then also it is very important because it is indicative of the possibility of a sclerotic metastasis. Once you have looked at the pedicles, you also carefully look at the interpedicular distance. If you have splaying of the pedicles in one of the levels in a trauma patient, it is very indicative of a burst fracture. In non-trauma situations also, interpedicular distance splaying or increased interpedicular distance is very important because it indicates myeloid dysplasia. In a patient in whom there is a myeloid dysplasia appearance with increased interpedicular distance, carefully look for the presence of a bony spur in between because that is indicative of a bony diastem. And these patients need to be carefully looked at and managed properly. If there is a fracture through the pedicle, then of course it means it's a chance fracture. So once you have observed the pedicles and the changes in them, you have to look at the spinous process. Now the spinous process is a very good indicator for loss of alignment. So you carefully look at the spinous process. And also, if there is a congenital anomaly of a spina bifida, a yes, spina bifida by itself is innocuous. It can be an incidental finding. But many of these patients also have facet tropism. So a spina bifida does not cause back pain, but the facet tropism or a pars intraarticularis rupture that it can be associated with can be a cause of uh, back pain. So when you note a spina bifida, you should carefully look for these changes in your lateral view. Now, if there is a destruction of the spinous process, as you see in this patient, then again, it means that there is a destructive lesion, and this is called the beakless outside. So the spinous process is the next one that you must actually look into. It. Lastly, of these three posterior appendages, the transverse process, and when you see a fracture, it definitely indicates a significant injury. Especially if you have a fracture of the transverse process in more than one, it is indicate of a severe abdominal injury. And if there is a fracture of the transverse process along with the sacral leg joint injury, it indicates a spinal pelvic disruption. And that is a very major injury. After you have looked at the posterior appendages, the next thing is to carefully look at the lumbosacral junction because this is the area which is very high in incidence of congenital uh, malformations. If you have to carefully look at the lumbosacral junction, you really need to look at the Ferguson view, which is where the beam is directed at 30 degrees scaphalic. So that this part is very clearly seen as you can see over here. Now, this shows on the left the normal picture that is taken. And on the right, you actually see the Ferguson view. So you can really clearly see the huge transverse process of L5, the pseudoarthrosis over here. You can see all the sacral foramen very clearly. You can see the sacral ear joint very clearly. So the Ferguson view is something that you should do to look at that transitional vertebra. 
be careful when you talk about the numbering of the vertebra. Make sure that to rule out a sacralization or identify whether there is a lumbarization of S1 because it has its own clinical uh, implications. Now, any of these transitional vertebra, there are many different types and we go by the Castavelli uh, classification. I'm not going deep into it, but you know, there are four different types. And this is very important because they can be associated with yeah, Bettel, Bettel or syndrome, where because of the pseudo-articulation, there could be a burst of formation. And these bursts of formation can also give rise to the far out uh, syndrome, where it can irritate a nerve root. So the clinical significance of a transitional vertebra is that there can be increased incidence of low back pain. It can be a part of a Bettel or syndrome. It can be a part of far out syndrome. And for a surgeon, if you are not identified it properly, there is also the increased chance of wrong level surgery. So look at the spina bifida, and next to that is the sacroiliac joint. You see, there are so many things to see in the AP view. And I have seen many of the young surgeons just look at the AP view for just a glance view and then take it off. Now, sacroiliac joint, you can should the sacroiliac arthritis or fusion of the joints can be the first indicator of a spondyloarthritis, ankylosing spondylitis. And the other thing that you should commonly note is the presence of osteitis condensis ileus. Now, why this is important? Because you should not associate it with ankylosing spondylitis. You should not associate it with a tumor. You should not think it is uh, inflammatory or infective origin. How you differentiate it is, it is always a uh, triangular dense uh, sclerosis at the lower part of the sacroiliac joint. It is usually bilateral and it is more on the iliac side and it is not associated with any problem. So make sure that you always look at uh, lack of sacral involvement or joint space narrowing is considered to be diagnostic of this condition. So once you have looked at this and also made sure that the hip joints are normal, you then start looking at the lateral view. So it's very difficult to number the vertebra in the lateral view. So you already must know about lumbarization or sacralization or the presence of a transitional uh, vertebra in the AP view before you start looking at the lateral view. You again look at the alignment and the posterior column and also, this is the only time that you can have a good assessment of sacrum and coccyx. So a picture like this is not adequate. And you must have uh, exposure like this where the sacrum and the coccyx are very clearly seen. So this is all very important. Otherwise, one in thousand cases, you will miss a diagnosis. So you again look at the alignment and you should have a normal lumbar lordosis. Now, you also should know that this lordosis is contributed to a great extent by the lower two levels. L4-5 and L5-S1 are the levels which contribute maximally to the lordosis. If you have the lumbar lordosis obliterated, it is indicative of early spondyloarthritis or a disc lesion with severe paraspinal spasm, which uh, leads to this condition. A reversal of this arch is called uh, kyphosis and also you can also look for, this is the time that you have to look for whether there is a listhesis over here. When you're looking at the lateral view, you look carefully at the vertebral body and the disc. And not only just at them in isolation, but two vertebral bodies and the disc and the facet joint is called the functional unit. So alterations of this is not only going to give you an idea of the anatomical change and the morphological change, but it also gives you an indication of the change in function, yeah, an alteration in the functional unit, and this is very important. The foremost important thing is that we need to look at disc degeneration. Now, there are two levels over here where there is a normal disc between L3 and L4, where you find there is a good disk space. 
the end plates are normal they are convex in shape and there is no irregularity over here and there is no major osteophytes in l3 in contrast to that if you look at the joint between the disc between l4 and l5 it carries all the uh, uh, radiological features in plain x ray of a disc degeneration a severe disc degeneration there is considerable loss of disc space there is a local kyphosis at that level the end plates have become thick sclerosed and also irregular there are very prominent osteophytes there is a retrolysis of l4 over l5 and this is a characteristic feature of a disc degeneration and also in the disc space you can faintly see there is a gas shadow what we call as the vacuum phenomenon or it goes by the sign called nuxen sign and because of the collapse the two vertebral bodies coming close to each other you are also having a compromise of the foramen now whenever you have a loss of disc space be careful to immediately look at the end plate now if you have an end plate which is not sclerosed which is lytic you can see some destructive elements going on there infection must be your good first diagnosis whereas this degeneration is always involved with uh, sclerosis <clears throat> when you have a disc degeneration at one levels always look at the entire spine because disc degeneration has 66% influence of genetics and so a uh, disc degeneration at one level always has a multiple level problem here you can see there is a lack of alignment you can see that there is a vacuum shadow in multiple levels lot of osteophytes and the loss of alignment over here and this is very important now kirkal devilis actually uh, has uh, put on the three stages of the disc disease where it goes for dysfunction instability and restabilization and here you can see that is exactly what is happening over here at l3 and l4 it is in the stage of dysfunction you can see that there is a lateral stenosis there is instability and there is a traction spur these are three important signs of instability so these patients will always have back pain when they have but at a lower level you can see it has gone on to the last stage of restabilization by complete collapse and also a large amount of traction spur so these are the two things and you will find that in patients they have uh, same patient can have it in multiple levels the attraction spur is one which is not at the border it is always about 2 or 3 mm above the margin and it is horizontal and it is uh, uh, not a sharp uh, ended one whereas the claw or the tri uh, is always pointing upwards or downwards and it's very huge fully ossified and it is always starting from the margin now when you look at their disc one of the other things is you should look at whether there is a calcification of the disc when there is a complete loss when there is a multi level degeneration of the disc if you find a calcification like this it denotes ochronosis and you can always confirm ochronosis by the presence of sacral leg joint changes and also extensive arthritis in the hip joint You, when you have these two findings i have found many of the students confusing ochronosis and ankylosing spondylitis and that's the reason i have put both of these here ankylosing spondylitis is distinct in the fact that very rarely you will have a decrease in disc space the disc space is usually very well maintained and you will also find that the end plates are very normal they are not irregular they are not destroyed and they are always seen very prominently and the calcification and ossification is on the anterior longitudinal ligament and the facet joint is always involved this is completely different to ochronosis where the disc space are completely reduced bone is always seen on bone and whatever is left of the disc space is uh, calcified and the facet joints not so much changed so once you have looked at the disc space the next thing is to look at the vertebral body you look carefully at the borders and also the texture 
you should have a good quality picture here because although you can see on the rights, you know that something is happening on the body. If you have poor quality x-rays, sometimes the lack lytic lesions in the body and change in the texture, you can often miss. There are very distinct uh, changes in the vertebral body, which is very diagnostic. Now, osteoporopetrosis, Pages disease, prostate metastasis, and fluorosis, they are all increased with sclerosis of the vertebral body of different patterns, as you can see over here. And they all have good diagnostic capacity. You can often now there are certain metabolic there conditions are also distinct which give uh, distinctive patterns. changes in the vertebral osteoporosis body. Osteoporosis is because the body is very weak, the disc is still maintained, and the discal pressure causes multiple small uh, fractures of the end plate, which actually leads to ballooning of the disc space, and the uh, appearance is that of a codfish vertebra. The next important is the rugged jersey spine, which is seen in renal osteodystrophy. In case of this and experience, once you see this characteristic pattern, it always stays in your mind. Initial Picture frame vertebra I, I do, is I very characteristic of Paget's disease. The you can see that so apart said, from the, the uh, picture frame appearance, you can also see that this vertebral body has become larger both in the, I mean, the AP view and you can see on the lateral, lateral view also no it will be large. And sclerotic metastasis so is to another okay, So all these so very characteristic, you have distinctive about radiological patterns must always be uh, click saved in your memory. So that when you see the next patients like this, then you will always remember space. this. So this is actually when you have osteoporosis and when you have an osteoporotic fracture. Yes, stress no, X-ray is very uh, important. Because then you will have the alligator sign positive. You can see that in the flexion view, the two cortices are coming close. But when you try to extend, you find that they are opening up what is called the alligator sign. Now, once you have seen the texture of the bone, then you look at the borders. And if you have anterior scalloping, and if this scalloping is over multiple bones, as you can see over here, then it is indicative of an aneurysm or a long-standing uh, prevertebral abscess. Similarly, a scalloping on the back is more associated with tumors or neurofibroma and in a developmental condition of this achondroplasty. But it is usually more common in a tumor and you must be careful. Vertebral body peaking, if it is a central anterior wedging and posterior scalloping, again, as we told, it's achondroplasia. Spondyloepiphyseal dysplasias and Hewlett syndrome and Marcus disease, they all have anterior peaking. And uh, these are all very diagnostic. Once you have seen the and cleared the vertebral body, you need to look at the posterior column. And this is the pedicle. Uh, the parts and the uh, posterior spinous process and the facet joint. Now, pedicles are more easily uh, assessed in the AP view, but a short stubby pedicle, a bulky one, is very indicative of spinal canal stenosis. We talk of the Pavlov's ratio or the Tog's ratio, where the ratio between the body and the posterior structures, if it is less than 0 0.8, it indicates significant. Uh, if you have a doubt, then you must return back to your AP view. And if you have a narrow interlaminar area, if you have a sagittalized facets. So in the AP view, normally the facets are not very clearly seen because they are more coronary oriented. When the facets are sagittally oriented, then it is indicative of canal stenosis. And also, if you have a narrow interpedicular distance and these two lines are parallel, then it confirms that there is a uh, problem. The next structure to look at is parts intraarticularis, uh, and that is indicative of uh, lysthesis. And these defects are very clearly seen whenever there is a lysthesis. The defect is very obvious. But wherever the defect is not obvious and clinically you suspect, 
then you have to do an oblique view. And this is a very characteristic uh, Scott Terrier sign where you can see that there is a defect over here. Now, the snout of the terrier is the transverse process. The superior articular process represents the ears and the inferior articular process represents the foreleg and the lamina represents the body. Now, once you have seen here, the pedicle is seen, the bullseye view is seen as the eyes. Now, this is necessary, but if you have a doubt, you should go in for advanced imaging over there. When you see a high-grade listesis, then there are associated features which you see over here. A beam which is coming from the front in the AP view, actually you can look at the lowermost vertebra. You can see the end on view. And this gives the appearance of the inverted Napoleon hat in the Ferguson's uh, view. A larger listesis, which we call the spondyloptosis, is always associated with a very prominent uh, Napoleon hat view, and it also always has a big sacral dome, a dysplastic posterior element, a vertical sacrum, and a trapezoidal L5. So these are all the features which indicates that these uh, lesions are quite positive and it will progress. Lastly, lateral views are not complete without stress views for instability. Now you can see here, the extension view looks good, except for the vacuum signs, but a flexion view very clearly shows that there is a translation and also a rotation, which means that there is a problem. Dynamic instability in this prolapse is so commonly missed because people are looking at the MRI and not looking at uh, a stress view. And if you're practicing in an institution, you must make it a, a dictum that all lateral views of the lumbar spine will be done with neutral flexion and extension because that's very, very critical. Same, if you're looking at the post-disc surgery pain, unless you do a stress x-ray, you will not be able to identify what is the extent of instability. Now, before I close, uh, I would like to talk about uh, some specific conditions. And uh, I'll just hurry through this because sacroiliitis, early you can see that it is very fluffy, irregular. There will be increase in uh, widening of the sacroiliac joint, more changes on the ilium side. And then at late stage, you can see that it is completely uh, fused. That is easy to diagnose. But... In the early stages, you should look for two signs. Because they are enthesopathies, and there is a lot of inflammation at the place where the ligament joins the bone in the corners, you will find some small erosions, and that is called the Romanus lesion. Or later, you can find that they become scleros and looks more prominent, and they are called the shiny corner signs. The other early sign in ankylosing spondylitis is that what is called the squaring of the vertebra. Normally, the lumbar vertebrae, they are concave on the anterior margin. And because of the deposition of the calcium over here, you can see that these vertebrae became completely squared. And these are very early signs. Whenever you have calcification, to differentiate it from dish, you will find that there is no extra bone formation and the calcification is vertical, and it is along the lines of the ALL, and there is a fusion of the facet joints. Whereas when you talk of uh, dish, you will find it is completely opposite. There is extensively a lot of new bone formation formed beyond the confines of the vertebral body, and you can find that these are almost like claws coming up and above and uh, fusing with each other. So you will also find that this extensive ossification is also in ischial tuberosity and the iliac crest, and that will give you a very good clue that it is different. Lastly, infections. I'm not going into deep because uh, that's a separate topic by itself. Most of these infections start in the disc space, and you can see that it is a paradiscal infiltration with uh, loss of uh, end plates, and at a later stage, more of the vertebral body is lost and a lot of kyphosis takes place. And at a more extensive stage, you will find that there is a complete collapse 
the facet joints open out on the back, and then that is the beginning stage of buckling collapse. Now, when does uh, infection become unstable, and when does it become uh, liable for a buckling collapse? You can easily find by looking for the spinal twist signs. These are four signs which are found in plain X-rays. Uh, you don't need advanced imaging for this. So fascicle separation on the lateral view, posterior retropulsion on the lateral view, a lateral translation on the AP view, and the toppling sign. Now, these four signs, if you have more than two signs, then you can be sure that there will be a huge increase in uh, deformity, and you have to be careful about these patients and get a spinal um, stabilization then yearly. Between tuberculosis and brucellosis, there is always a confusion. But in brucellosis, the vertebral body destruction is usually very less. You will find that very little vertebral body destruction takes place. There is a lot of ossification of the ligaments and the proliferant parabic appearance over here. A lot of sclerosis even during the active stage, which differentiates uh, TB and uh, this. So I have just put off a lot of data, maybe too much of uh, points to be digested in one go. But these uh, presentations, what Dr. Pushpa presented and I have said, they're all going to be on the YouTube. And so you can go back to see the regular features and a lot of sclerosis even during the active stage. Now, I would like to say this uh, again. If you have to be a good orthopedic surgeon, you need to be your own radiologist, at least for plain x-rays. Having a very good musculoskeletal radiologist is critically important for every orthopedic unit to become complete. But you should know the radiological basis of all the diseases so that you will make a good diagnosis. And also, it's very important that you should know that radiology comes after clinical examination. Whatever the patient gives in your hand, even if they give you the x-ray before they start telling their history, make sure that you do a good history taking and the clinical examination because x-ray is never a substitute for good history and physical examination. So as they say, see, hear, feel, and then do the investigations. And that will be a good part of clinical radiology also. So as Louis Pasteur said, you need to know what you're looking for. And in the fields of observation, chance favors only the prepared and the learned mind. So thank you very much for this opportunity.